Good. No memory slips. <laughs> that was a big improvement over November. How did you feel about it? Yeah, towards the end mostly. But you held it together pretty darn well. I'm quite pleased, a big step up from November. So I wanna talk about, I wanna kind of give an overview so we can best use our time. I wanna talk about practicing a little bit, playing cleaner, getting good round chords, good sound. I wanna talk about your tendonitis. I wanna talk about the form of the piece a little bit, or more so how to hold a big long story together like this. And I think there's a few places where maybe not holding back so much and then other places you want to hold back more, maybe some different characters we can bring out. Um, but I want to ask, how, how long have you been working on this and how much longer do you plan to work on this? Like what, what are your goals with this piece? Okay. Um, very on and off. But so, so it's an old friend at this point. Yes. Um, <laughs> I, I plan on using it for college auditions next year if I don't go this year. Okay. Yeah, Brendan mentioned something a little bit about that. Uh, I'm curious, are you going to school for music? Are you thinking about it? It's, it's tricky because I got into Oberlin this year. Congrats. Not for, not for music. Oh, okay. Um, for the science college, but very I, good school for that. Yeah, I would still have the opportunity to do a lot of music, even though I'm not in the conservatory. Sure, sure. Um, a sensible path. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. I might keep keep it around for a while. Yeah, Brendan mentioned you're 16 going off to school. You must have skipped some grades or something along the way. Kindergarten. Oh, okay. It was Gotcha. Well, I was held back in kindergarten, so I didn't go till I was 18. Uh, so you're ahead of me there. But uh, are you thinking about school for music? Yeah, definitely considering it. Uh, where would you be applying? Um, Oberlin, again. Um, like a double major type thing? Yeah, yeah. Um, so you got in this year for science. Mm -hmm. So what would you do over the next year? Uh, the Just next take a gap year? year? I applied to interlocking. Ah. And I was more planning on going there right after I had finished the summer camp because, you know, I was just there. It was very, very captivating. Um, I, so I went to Aspen and then Brevard and then Bowdoin with Brendan way back in the day. Mm -hmm. The most fun time of my life. Yeah. Isn't, it's when you f get to experience independence. Mm -hmm. It's a blast. But uh, if I don't go to college next year, I would go to Interlochen to work on piano extensively and then uh, that fall or that winter I would audition for Oberlin for the Royal Institute mm. um, the one in New York Manus Juilliard Manhattan those are the big three no um, maybe maybe New York I don't know yeah yeah um, some other general. okay good well so I went to Oberlin for a year with Brendan you may have heard that mm -hmm. earlier and then I transferred right away after that first year to the Cleveland Institute. Uh, I studied with Papa Baldi and a little bit with Bobby on. Um, great schools, for sure. Uh, I'm not gonna give you recommendations on schools, but I will be real with you on your playing and where it stacks up in terms of getting into these places. If I'm being very honest and I see your potential, and that's the only reason I'm being honest, Juilliard's a long shot with how you're playing now. Um, but it's not out of the question if, if you can clean some things up. I think that if you can clean some things up, Oberlin and CIM could be shoe-ins. Very, very possible for you. Um, and there's nothing wrong with not getting into Juilliard. I didn't get into Juilliard when I applied around, well, two years older than you and uh, I vowed to make them regret it. And then four years later, I was beating all of them in competitions. But uh, it was motivation. So there's nothing wrong with not peaking yet. <laughs> a lot of those students peak now and then they burn out four or five years later. Yeah, so 
And in fact, I am so thankful I didn't get into Juilliard because there's an essence, there's an element that you're kind of one of many great talents there and you get lost in the shuffle, not much personal attention and you just, you, you kind of just get lost there and you don't grow much. So uh, that's why I loved Cleveland Institute of Music with a teacher who gave everything to me, lots of extra time and, and, and that's, that's what helped me get over the top. So uh, be careful what you wish for with that. That being said, um, I think your practice habits need some help if you're gonna get over the top. Right now, you have weak fingers, if I'm being very honest. Um, things like these chords, they sound a little more as opposed to like a perfect bed and then a perfect melody. Sometimes the middle notes dropped, or it's just inconsistent and we need more consistency. And that, that would go with some of these runs as well. Can I ask how you practice this? Or do you have a strategy? Um, well, lately I've been doing a lot of slow practice. Good. Um, not really much of any. Bad. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So it's the, the, the metronome is the magic device. And uh, you probably heard some of, some of what I was explaining to her. Or may I, did you? And towards the end. Okay, got it. Uh, the metronome is, is the key to everything. Slow and loud is the key to everything. And I mean everything. I can't play it anymore, but... Can you, it sounds very unmusical, I know that this is going somewhere, but it's creating a perfect way of playing. The athletics are taken care of, so then it becomes very easy to shape it the way you want. Can we just do this a couple of times? Just play the first phrase, let's take it all the way until the forte, and just beat it to death both hands. this so it lands on the beat Good. let's actually just stick with that try again We want to be shaping the way we're actually going to be playing when we practice this way. It's not all just beat it like a machine. It's actually drilling in the muscle memory of the movements we're going to be using to create art here soon. So for instance, I wouldn't suggest dropping on the note. We want to produce the sound from down up. And you can get to the bottom of the key bed, play with flat fingers. The most singing, beautiful um, melodic sound comes from the softest part of our finger and getting to the bed of the keys. So instead of, oops, it's, and then here, you're actually playing staccato before coming here, but it's da da. So it's here's a down motion to there. Can we try that? It's a lot. Care, careful, again, I saw down. You know, Leon Fleischer put it perfectly that you want to think about these melody notes kind of like you're releasing a balloon into the air and you're producing the sound and then it just floats up and away. So think down and release. Pat of the finger, massage the key. Better, now let's do it all double forte. I'd say that was mezzo forte. 
I'm, I'm talking. Oh, but don't drop. Keep going. Now, same thing. Oops. Wow, what am I doing? Oh. That loud. What we're doing is we're erasing the artistic chalkboard so that we can make art here in a moment. musically and let's think about the couple things we want to think about it, it's the um, top notes obviously beautiful crescendo slur and then left hand takes over more effortless and it was a little more crystal clear. You can apply that everywhere and it will do the same darn thing. Now some places require uh, a little more effort than that but even the slow stuff I play loud just to maintain it. I call it maintaining it and then then you have the freedom to emote the way you want. The piece that I'm, I'm playing a lot and that I can give a few more examples with is the fourth ballad. I'll be performing it here in May. Do you know it? I've heard it. It's a, it's a, oh, he's, he's mentioned my playing of yeah. it probably. He, he tends to like it, but, uh, um, well, I play more than just that well, <laughs> despite what he might say. Um, but for instance, so incredibly unmusical. But I'm setting up the fingers to do this. consistency and it's not hard to do when practiced the way I was telling you okay um, so when you get to these more technical spots the key is slow and loud uh, just like this but this you don't need the metronome for you just need to beat it once or twice or three times and then you have the control like you just demonstrated but in the more technical spots you're going to need the metronome and find about a 50% speed, zero in on your section, like a, a long piece like this, probably you'd have eight to 10 different practice zones that, that I would consider working in. And just play it super even, super loud, 50% or 60% speed, and then gradually walk it up to 80, 90%. Then here's the key. With the technical stuff, it's gonna to start to fall apart when you get fast, because some of those technique zones are a little bit unattainable. You have to grow into it. Lock it back in slow. That's the magic of it. If you end at the top speed you're capable of, where it's starting to fall apart, that's what your muscle memory is gonna grow with overnight. If you finish perfectly and slow, that's what our muscle memory is gonna grow into overnight. So you can actually hack your own neurons to work for you even while you're not practicing. 
I've saved so many hours of practice by that one trick alone. Speed it up, get it a little uncomfortable, lock it back in slow. And then work in small sections. That, that's the other key. Um, it, this is one of those pieces where uh, we could work together on this for, for six months and still leave things on the table to, to discuss. So we, we have to be very choosy over uh, what we work on today. So I'm trying to give you big picture notes that you can apply on your own. But the practice zones is a big one. The loud practice with the metronome, speed it up, lock it back in slow. I want to ask about the tendonitis. Is that a chronic thing? No. Did you injure yourself, or is it a new thing you're worried about? Um, I'm not really sure where it came from. I've, I haven't been experiencing pain, even though I've been working on a fairly good piece, Walshin. Oh, okay. Um, that, that's one of my war horses. Oh, <laughs> good. <laughs> um, but I... I hope you play it in May. I might. I might. We'll see. Yeah. It just sort of appeared overnight. It didn't. Was it from practicing a certain section? Not that I can remember, because I, I haven't been playing anything at full speed. Um, I've just been doing slow practice almost exclusively. Got it. And Good. Burst practice, but... Well, hopefully slow and with the metronome. Well, one of the two. <laughs> Seriously, though, uh, you have a practice zone until New practice zone. New practice zone. Of course, hit this. And then a good way to practice voicing is exaggerate the difference. Double forte, double piano. Then. You can get that perfect sound. A couple tips for that. But lock those sections in with the metronome. I'm telling you, it is your fastest path to getting where you want to go. Uh, I, pardon me, I'm going to say the same story that I told Yo-Yo. And if you were here, just stop me. But I think it's worth saying again. My, I was bringing a piece, uh, probably similar level. It actually may have been the blood that you're playing. And it may have been a similar level to that. And I may have been playing it six to 12 months or more like you. I don't think I was that long, but certainly more than six months. And my teacher said to me, wow, you must be really patient. I'm like, what are you talking about? Did, did, did you hear me say that to her? No. But... It, and I tell every single student I have this story because it blew my mind then. And it's, it's true. Um, I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm, I'm trying to play fast. I'm trying to get it. I'm doing everything I can. He's like, no, you got to be patient in the moment to be impatient long term. Does that make sense? In a way. Meaning if you're patient in the moment, you're flipping on the metronome to, to slow half speed, something that requires a lot of personal discipline. You're patient as you go through the process on that day. But you're going to clean things up in a couple of weeks. If you keep practicing without the metronome, if you keep practicing with weak fingers, you're going to come back to me in six months and we're still going to be working on this. So you have to be patient in the moment to be impatient long term. It's one of my favorite stories and it changed my life if you want to know the truth. So yeah, and, and all these places where I was saying that some of these chords are just a little inconsistent. Like a middle note is, is not quite where you want it. That will get cleaned up by this loud playing. You want to even things out before creating the art out of it. I wanted to tell you something before. You had no memory slips today, so kudos. <laughs> but I've, I really felt for you in November. It, you seemed pretty distraught after, I mean, kind of falling on your face a few times which is fine, everyone's been there. Uh, I, that happened to me in a very high stakes situation. I, I was playing the Brahms Paganini. Do, do you know it? The, the, one of the, probably one of the top five, 10 hardest pieces. 
it was in the semifinals of a, a medium to big sized competition. I was playing my heart out. I was in pretty good shape. I get to the finale of this and I just skipped the second to last page. And I just total memory slip, kind of fumbled, but then I caught myself, I got to the end. Of course I didn't pass. It's, it's a painful feeling, like it, it hurts. I vowed to never let that happen again. And so I have a system now that I've, it's never failed me. It, it takes care of stage fright because most of stage fright is not being mentally aware of what you're working on, but it takes care of the memory problem. Do you want to know it? So there's two types of memory. There's muscle memory and then there's mental memory. And what happens is in our practice, our muscle memory takes over so much that our mental memory starts to disappear. What do I mean by that? Well, we can check out mentally. We can pretty much not even be here. We, we don't need to be present and our fingers will just be able to play a passage, play the piece, play, play the page. But if one said, hey, could you start right here in the middle of this thing? Your mind might not know which note you're trying to play. So what happens is when we get on stage, we take for granted that the muscle memory is all we need to know. And when we see the audience out there or we start getting nervous before we play, it makes us hyper aware to what we're doing, causing your mental memory to kick in. And if that's not solid, that's when memory slips happen. So how do we fix the mental memory? I like the br most brainless, easiest path, patient to be impatient path through all of this. The key is having memory checkpoints throughout the piece. Have you heard about this? Yeah. Like here would be one. And in a piece like this, they can be a little bit bigger. I would say one to two a page-ish. Make it based on sections. However, with Bach, every measure, every two measures. And it's not just having those checkpoints, it's being able to start at the end and from memory work backwards from those checkpoints and have them just totally locked in. And in more dense sections, the checkpoints should be uh, closer together. I'll give you an example. They're the coda of the fourth ballade. So I take it from, I can start. It's been so long since I've played this. I, I gotta bring it back soon. Let's see. There we go. So that's one, back it up a little bit. it up now I'm there next one and I'm literally just working backwards by every two measures now that's not enough also hand separately from memory so and so forth it's effort it's sort of like learning a new piece of music uh, to learn it that way but once you learn it that way you just got to maintain it like once a week because it's not going to go anywhere. And if you have that maintained, you're never going to wind up wondering what the next note is. And you should be in good shape. I I've never had a memory slip since. So keep that in mind. Uh, I I'm going to have to pack up here about five more minutes. But let's, let's talk about the, the form or, or a couple of areas that, that may help musically. I would not take every single marking. This is gonna sound like it's gonna be blasphemy, but not every marking needs to be perfectly adhered to. 
it's romantic music. And I, mainly I think the pedaling is what I'm thinking about with all of this. But it's romantic music. Rules are, are meant to be broken if you know them and can tastefully do it. Um, so, th yeah, th there were a few times you followed the pedal so literally, but it, it didn't quite make sense for the music. And, and you have to realize pianos were a little bit different back then. And if you listen to, to recordings of this, like, they're all over the map in terms of what people do. So in terms of the music, this theme, I wanted to hear more of a character change. Like we have all this beautiful stuff, melodic, and now we have a more playful section. And I feel like you're, you're overlapping them and bleeding them together a little too much. Whereas it'd be nice to just be clearly in a new character. So. Just right away into the new character instead of being. It, it, it's, I would just start the new character sooner. That's my opinion. Um, now, did you not like that comment? What? No, it's, I'm just considering, because I found it, I don't know. Earlier I talked about having, not giving it to you earlier, except for the back section. Yeah, so, so he, he's kind of saying the same thing. It, it's one of those where we could easily spend three lessons dissecting it. But just know that there's room for experimentation is all I'm really trying to say. Sometimes it's hard, though. That like back when I was your age, I, I might have fallen in love with some type of beautiful momentary thing. And it would have been really hard for me to hear a teacher say, like, to, to break away from it. So that, that, that's why I asked. But I do think having more clear characters uh, and structures around them would, would help the overall shape of the piece. I felt myself really wanting some more speed towards the end. And I think it's not necessarily just the speed. It is the transitions into the various sections towards the end. There's an element of where, in these ballads, it's like we introduce a character, then we have a nice breath, a new character, then a new character, and then they start stacking closer together until it builds to this culmination. So if the breaths in between these characters stay the same, we're not really going anywhere. So at some point you need to start pushing through a little bit more so it kind of spirals into this peak, this beautiful peak at the end. I'm thinking here a little bit. I would have liked it to crescendo to continue and for there not to be a phrase break. I would have just loved it to just, it, it's the payoff for this big growth that we've been doing. Can we take it from somewhere around here, actually? Wherever you're comfortable leading into this. Sure. Slow and loud, we'll fix that. This is something, um, uh, it'd be nice to hear this top E flat grace note. Can we back it up to the trills? Just lush and big. Push. Keep going. Hold that. Bottom. Don't don't. Yeah, and I would. 
would even play around uh, exaggerating the slur. A little more. And I think what creates that playful quality is not varying the sound. So if you ease in or varying the tempo. I think if you just start almost metronomic, then you can dip, of course, as the phrase begins. But that would help separate the character a little bit. What we got to keep moving. Here was another place leading into this. It was, uh, I just, you pulled back just a little too much when it's time for things to just keep growing and, and pushing forward. That was one of those moments. Then as we kept going, it was a little too sensitive here. I think it just needs to keep exploding. Same with here, just let it grow. It's all very organic. And there's plenty of time early on to just show these characters and breathe in between them. But you have to know when to push as well. And there's times when less is more. If every phrase is special, then no phrase is special. So at some point, you just got to let it grow and expand. And then here, I would love more speed. And I would recommend a little bit of an accent on the left hand, on the beats. And yes, this is the sforzando, but the sforzando will come through more clearly if we feel where the pulses are. And it's da-dum, da-dum. There's a little bit of a motif as well. Otherwise, if you just do this forzando and this is only quiet, then the listener starts hearing this as the beat. So we need to give a pulse so we know where the syncopation is. Oh gosh, there's so much I want to work on, but we're going to have to stop. It, it's on its way though, and you feel music very well. And I think uh, Brendan is doing a great job with phrasing and things like that. So I'm, I'm rooting for you, I have high hopes for you, but I think you need, you need some disciplined metronome loud work. And then um, just think about these phrases and when to push and when to pull back. Of course.